Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, the FCC for this uh, online Zoom event. Uh, the topic is press freedom in the pandemic. Are governments using COVID-19 to quash dissent? We're very lucky to have with us uh, three speakers, Maria Ressa, Mohammed Hanif, and Helene Franchineau. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the FCC and senior international editor of Bloomberg News here in Hong Kong. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to uh, ask you to do a few things. First, please mute microphones. Um, feel free to submit questions through the chat and we will save qu time for questions at the end. They will be forwarded to me by Sarah Graham, our events coordinator, who is on. And a record of this event will be available later today, both on our site and on YouTube. Uh, keep watch for um, uh, social media messages about when that is available. So I'll go into uh, introductions. These three people actually need no introduction, but I will introduce them anyways. Um, Maria Ressa is the CEO and executive editor of Rappler, uh, rappler.com. She's been honored around the world for her work in fighting disinformation, fake news, and attempts to silence the press. In 2018, she was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year and won the prestigious Gold Pen of Freedom Award from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers. She's been a journalist in Asia for more than 30 years, and uh, it will be relevant, particularly today, that she was at the uh, largest broadcaster in the Philippines, which is in the news now. She worked there. So um, I think that, that will be particularly interesting to uh, discuss today. Uh, Helene Franchino is an independent visual journalist based in Istanbul. She covers Turkey and the region for media organizations and NGOs. Uh, she had been a video journalist for the Associated Press based in Beijing and a multimedia journalist for the South China Morning Post based here in Hong Kong. So she's quite familiar with Hong Kong. Uh, and Mohammed Hanif uh, was born in Pakistan and lived for many years in the UK before returning to Karachi where he now resides. After leaving the Pakistan Air Force Academy to pursue a journalism career, he worked for the BBC, the Washington Post and many other uh, publications. He's penned plays for the stage and the screen and is a novelist. I think three novels, am I right? Uh, we had him here at the uh, FCC uh, late last year and uh, he has, his works have been translated into 22 languages. So we're really lucky. These are three um, uh, of, uh, the, of the um, most important voices or some of the most important voices in press freedom from their regions. And uh, so we're very lucky to have them all here today. Uh, I'd like to start off by asking each of them to talk a little bit about this topic, um, whether governments in their region have been using the coronavirus outbreak uh, to restrict, uh, uh, to quell dissent in their countries and to restrict freedom of the press. We are obviously particularly interested in how it's affecting press freedom, given that we are celebrating uh, Press Freedom Day, actually Press Freedom Week now. Press Freedom Day was the other day. Uh, for instance, here in Hong Kong, some critics of the government say that the four-person gathering limit, which is now being changed to eight people, is part of an attempt by the government to try to make it difficult for anti-government protests to restart. And overnight, we've had the news that the Philippines has shut down its largest broadcaster. Uh, so I'd like to actually start with Maria, given that uh, we, with that news in the Philippines. Uh, what do you, do you think, Maria, the government there is using this as a kind of blatant attempt uh, to restrict a, and attack press freedom and other freedoms uh, under the guise or under uh, uh, the, the uh, reasoning that they have to restrict uh, movement and uh, you know, any kind of gatherings because of the coronavirus? Actions speak louder than words, right? Uh, on, uh, we are in the eighth week of lockdown in Manila and a lockdown that has focused far more on the security aspects, checkpoints in, in different parts of the city uh, versus the three T's, test, trace, treat, right? Uh, aid for people, uh, especially our poor, has been slow in coming. And by week eight, we were only at something like 30% distribution of the emergency powers and the emergency budget that the executive received within 24 hours of asking for it. Uh, so I, I think the most important one is uh, the shutdown, not of our economy, but of 
the largest broadcaster. ABS CBN is the uh, largest uh, television station. It is a largest group of radio stations. It is unthinkable that this could happen in the in an, a democracy. Uh, there is a legal veneer for the government actions that it's taken, but this is clearly a violation of principles of press freedom and also clearly the latest in a pattern that began four years ago. You know, we went through our own problems and are still continuing to go through that. But uh, it's a it rings a death knell for press freedom and for democracy if this continues. I think the last the second thing I'll say is that our emergency powers, the law that President Duterte signed because of this this pandemic, gives snuck in at the last minute in the early morning hours of the of the debate in Congress. And that allows them to essentially jail any person, journalist or not, anyone who posts anything on social media that is deemed to be inciting and that there's no definition for it except for what the government wants. Uh, and also they have to, excuse me, to pay a hefty fine. Um, Early on, we know that these extraordinary times of the coronavirus require extraordinary measures, but we need to make sure that our what we do for the virus, for fighting the virus, doesn't actually leave behind uh, more problems for us to deal with as a, as a democracy. Yeah, can we talk a little bit, um, before we go to the to our other panelists, um, I wanted to ask you just a little bit more about that broadcaster, because most many of um, us, you know, uh, that are not in the Philippines, who are not in the Philippines, may not be that familiar with it. This was a broadcaster, correct, that had been very critical of President Duterte and, and the regime there, correct? This is not, um, it, it, there has been some bad blood between them, correct? Could you get, could you fill us in a little bit on that? I, you know, again, you can look at me as uh, somebody who is in bias in the sense that I'm a journalist and ABS-CBN did what journalists do, which is to hold power to account. I think, you know, to help people in the international community, think about it this way. The last time this television network went black was in the 70s. It was part of uh, the declaration of martial law, and that brought in 21 years of a dictatorship. This is the kind of benchmark we're crossing now. They went dark last night, in case you, you know, they did right. their final newscast and then they went black. And right now, they are, they are one of the main uh, vehicles for finding out about what's happening in the Philippines about the coronavirus, correct? It's, it's, it's somewhat ironic that at a time when people need more information, they're, they're, they're closed. I think it, it's not only that, it's the fact that they become a cautionary tale like Rappler was before. Don't report critically, don't ask questions uh, or else this can happen to you. But also beyond that, this is a huge network, right? When I was, when I was heading the news group there, uh, so gosh, this would have, I left in 2005, 2005. The market cap of ABS-CBN is $450 million. You're talking about 11,000 employees at a time when uh, our, our, uh, our cabinet is saying that we're expecting a contraction in the economy. Of course, let's throw more jobless people out. Uh, it's unthinkable. So it's, it's a media, it, it's not only thinking about the press freedom issue, you're saying this is also a, a media issue and media jobs and, and what that can mean as well. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you. Let's turn to uh, Mohammed Hanif. Can you tell us, uh, you're, you're uh, zoomed in from Pakistan. Can you tell us what's happening there, uh, both with the virus and, uh, and, and what is happening with the government and their uh, attempts to uh, control it and how that might affect uh, press and and, uh, and uh, freedom of other you know, freedom of speech in general. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think uh, some of the issues uh, related to uh, media freedom were uh, uh, already there since this uh, new government uh, came into power. Uh, it had sort of. Uh, launched an all-out uh, campaign to purge the media of all critical voices. And uh, since the pandemic started, if you mm, look at the news cycle in Pakistan, and if you look at the social media, 
there are days when it would seem that the government is actually fighting the media rather than fighting the pandemic. And there are one example I'll give you is that the Pakistan's largest media group, which is Jang Group, they have, uh, the, they have uh, TV networks, uh, they have the oldest, most widely circulated newspapers, websites. Uh, so their owner, uh, Mish Kilaraman, uh, was uh, arrested uh, right at the beginning of this pandemic, March 12th, I think it was, when the pandemic was, was starting, when we were beginning to talk about it. And he's being held, no charges have been filed against him. And he's been held on the accusation that he acquired a property through, by using influence uh, about 40 years ago. So the, 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 uh, the accusation is that he acquired a property 40 years ago and he's been held. Every journalist organization, every newspaper organization, every human rights organization in Pakistan and internationally have condemned his arrest. But the government refuses to budge. And as if that was not enough, uh, obviously there's a pandemic, there's a restriction on kind of how many people can gather. So the journalists and other newspaper employees have tried to protest, but obviously you can't do that. On social media, Every second day, the top trend you will see is a Pakistani journalist's name who's being pointed out as a traitor or as a hate figure. And what they did was that yesterday, the Prime Minister had a press conference. They happened to be there and they asked a question which the government, the Prime Minister, did not like. So the next 24 hours are being spent on kind of condemning them, proving them that they are the problem just because they raised their hand and asked an awkward question. Uh, Pakistani media had been in a crisis even before the pandemic started uh, because of uh, the, the government squeeze on the media. Uh, the media owners uh, have also um, found this as an opportunity to either do uh, large scale layoffs some of Pakistan's uh, most well-known journalists uh, have been out of job for a year or so. Uh, and then another thing, which has become almost like a business model in Pakistan now, that you work in a media organization and the chances are that you will not get paid for four months, for five months. People are getting the salaries that they were supposed to get in November, December last year. And that is if they are uh, lucky. So you are in a strange kind of situation where uh, you are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, uh, the media is in a squeeze. You are lucky to have a job, but you're not getting paid. And if you leave that job, then that means that you won't even get paid for the last four or five months salary which you're owed. So I know many of these journalists who are not getting paid, but who are stuck in their newsroom and trying to do uh, uh, their uh, work. So that is the general overview in Pakistan. And obviously, uh, the other problems that we had, which was about political dissidents uh, being either um, kidnapped by the state agencies or just being shot. So now they were hardly getting any coverage in, in the pre-pandemic times. And now, of course, uh, newsrooms have a big excuse that, you know, we are only focused on one story. So if the state agencies pick up two students in some village and shoot them dead, they will not even find a mention in our news site. Well, thank you for, for painting that picture, um, chilling as it is. So, so that we understand this is, you're saying a lot of this had been sort of happening anyways in Pakistan, but mm -hmm. are you saying that the, the outbreak and the restrictions that have had to be put in place as a result of the outbreak are, are giving the government, um, are, are allowing them to, um, or causing them to really double down on, on these particular strategies? Yes, and, and kind of, uh, and come up with structures, which will, I think, outlast uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, the prime minister is just appointed in the middle of pandemic, uh, uh, a media advisor who happens to be a former general. And now Pakistan is, uh, for whatever it means, is a democracy. 
And that has never happened before in Pakistan, that you pick up a recently retired general who used to manage media on the army's behalf. So now he's been brought in to manage us because it seems, although I thought the civilian government was doing a, a good enough job of managing us, putting us in our place, taking our jobs away, uh, arresting uh, our colleagues, uh, but they seem to think, that, oh, no, 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 this is, uh, this is not enough. Uh, these guys need to be sorted on a regular basis. So my feeling is that there's a, uh, there's a, there's a media management model which kind of uh, is based on, on these assumptions that these wars with media are not one-off things. These have to be ongoing. And not only we have to be told uh, what we can't report, but also we have to be convinced, we have to be coerced into believing that what story we should be uh, sending out. So we are kind of into the next stage of censorship, which is, just, is not satisfied with just a don't report this. We also want to make sure that report this and report it wholeheartedly, report it with a smile on your face. I think it's very interesting what you're saying about um, having these things staying in place uh, later on, that this, was, mm. this will be something that will outlive the pandemic. Uh, mm. I'd like to turn to Helene and, um, and ask you that, that same question. What do you find in, in Turkey and in your region where you report? Um, give us the state of what's happening there uh, in terms of both the virus and in terms of you know, restrictions and, and how that is uh, affecting press freedom and, and uh, freedom of speech. Uh, so in Turkey, the situation is quite different. Um, we haven't had a proper curfew, proper lockdown, um, because the economy has to keep going. Um, so we are, we are free to go out and about, except for people over 65 years old or under 20 years old. And for the biggest cities, we only have a weekend curfew. Um, that's because the Turkish economy is, is going quite bad and the authorities absolutely want it to keep going. Uh, but the lira is staying, the GDP is down. Um, but the authorities want to keep control of the narrative uh, very much. So the response, how you speak about the response, they really want to keep a control of that. So the President Erdogan and his AK party, uh, they have launched a national fundraiser uh, for the people to donate money and to fund the response against COVID. Um, and they have actually shut down the uh, independent initiatives, the initiatives coming from opposition controlled municipalities. They have uh, shut that down. They have frozen the, their charity's bank account. They have launched criminal probes because they want to make sure that they control the narrative, um, that any kind of response comes from them. Um, some people might say that Erdogan is more concerned about maintaining his grip on power, on his electability, what people uh, say of him, rather than fighting the, uh, the, the virus. The Ministry of Health every day is holding a, a press briefing about the numbers of uh, the virus, uh, how many deaths, how many cases, which has been uh, quite appreciated. Uh, however, um, the numbers have been very vague. Uh, there, is no, there was no location, no gender, um, no additional data, uh, which the media haven't really, um, they haven't really took up on that. They haven't really criticized that. They haven't really dug on why, why was that, are the numbers really uh, true or not? So some in, in independent initiatives have sprung up to try and learn more about the, number, the real number of COVID cases in Turkey. So for example, the Turkish Medical Ad Association, they have uh, called themselves the hospitals in Turkey that have done their own investigation and they have published their own numbers. That was in late March, um, which then the numbers of cases were different than that of the authorities. And so this has forced the authorities to be more transparent, uh, to revise their numbers. And so uh, we see that the, uh, 
what comes from the authorities, they are a bit behind from the uh, independent initiatives, either come from, coming from the opposition or coming from independent organiza organizations. So it's, it's always a little bit of play to catch up. Um, some mayors have, have started uh, distributing free masks. Um, the authorities have stopped all of that. And now it's a centralized system. We have to sign up online uh, and to, uh, give our ID number, etc., and then we can hope to have our free mask. I've done that, I've never received my mask, so it doesn't really work. But that's the only way you can have mask because the sales have been forbidden. Um, if free bread is distrib distributed, this is stopped and this is a new initiative coming from the authorities and so on and so on. Um, another thing that has happened is that the uh, parliament has passed a law releasing dozens of thousands of prisoners because there was a risk of contagion of the COVID, of course, in the prison. So the law was passed to release about 90,000 prisoners from, from, uh, from the prisons. Um, however, the law uh, excludes uh, people who have been, who are who were in pretrial uh, detention and also people who have been uh, convicted of terrorism related crimes. And these charges are very fr are frequently used uh, against journalists, against human rights defenders, um, academics, especially after the uh, attempted coup in July uh, 2016. So people, people who have committed uh, real crimes have been uh, released, but people whose crime were uh, uh, their um, uh, using their uh, right of expression, freedom of expression, are still in jail. And uh, the authorities have said we should uh, release people, prisoners who are over uh, 65 years old, but actually a lot of uh, the journalists who are imprisoned uh, today in Turkey are over 65 years old, but they are still in jail. And uh, they are uh, about uh, 85 journalists uh, currently in prison in Turkey, including four women. Thank so you. that's a bit of the situation in Turkey. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my, for my next question, it, it's, it's actually right on the point that Helene was making there. Uh, the UN Human Rights Office last week, right on the eve of World Press Freedom Day, uh, said disturbing details have emerged from dozens of countries about what they term, uh, this is their term, a toxic lockdown culture in which populations could be, could be controlled in regimes, especially authoritarian regimes and, and some that may be democracies but don't necessarily look like it right now, um, they could enhance their control and power. And I wanted to ask each of our, our panelists whether they think that um, you know, this is the intent here, that um, what had perhaps been starting off as, um, as measures to contain the virus um, are really now being used uh, as part of this toxic lockdown culture, a way to continue to lock down um, parts of the society that they would rather not hear from, that it's actually a deliberate attempt. Um, because that is, that is what would be even more chilling than just seeing, um, seeing some of the effects of this. Um, and I guess we'll start with Maria, given that, um, you know, again, you have, you have, uh, we have uh, perhaps some evidence of this happening in your country. I think first, you know, in case, in case you are not aware of what's happened to Rappler, uh, this, the problems were always there, like in Pakistan uh, and the virus. Uh, dealing with a pandemic only exacerbated the original problems that were there. So in our case, for example, in uh, exponential attacks online began in 2016. They were followed a year later by attacks of the president himself at a State of the Nation address against Rappler. Uh, in a year, we were uh, we were faced with 11 investigations and uh, in 2019, so that was 2018. And then in 2019, um, I was arrested twice, detained, and had to post bail eight times to be able to be free. I have paid more in bail and bonds than Imelda Marcos, who's been convicted in four different countries, right? So that was our state before the pandemic. Um, right. <laughs> I, I think what, what you need to see, what we see in the Philippines is that uh, the pandemic itself, uh, the government scrambled to deal with it. It was clear, and remember, we were the first case 
uh, of the virus outside of China, and it traveled directly from Wuhan to Manila. Uh, since then, um, our first uh, lockdown was announced on March 12th. On the Ides of March, the lockdown came into place in Manila, in the capital, and then slowly spread to other parts of the country. Most of the announcements, President Duterte in late night rambling announcements, nationwide announcements, would focus on security. Uh, and I particularly remember April 1, because that night, it was in a near midnight address. He said, he told the police and the military that if people violate quarantine rules, that they should, and this is a direct quote, shoot them dead, shoot them dead. Uh, on April 2, a farmer uh, was stopped at a checkpoint and he wasn't wearing a mask. It's mandatory now to wear a mask when you go out publicly. So the, the farmer wasn't wearing a mask. He's 63 years old. And uh, the people who stopped him uh, called the police. And we only learned about this from a police report released days later. The police said that he was drunk. He was carrying a, a bolo knife. And uh, because he was unruly, he was shot and killed. That was the first death. The second death was far more public, and it was a former military officer, and there's an investigation because of that. Uh, there have been so many instances of police brutality that we continue to report on, even while under lockdown. But let me just give you the stats. More than 40,000 people have been arrested in one month. Uh, uh, actually, it is until, until May 3rd. World Press Freedom Day. So more than 40,000 people arrested. But if you take into account, and these are the police's own numbers, all of the people who have been stopped at checkpoints and either warned or fined uh, and arrested, you're talking about more than 160,000 people. Um, that's the first. The second one is, uh, since our courts are closed, what happens when they get arrested, right? How do they get free? I mean, we have stories of of people who have been in lockdown, uh, who have been in prison because of that. And then to take it into the prison themselves, our prisons are overcrowded. They're COVID-19 um, sanctuary. I mean, they're places where right. it will spread. And so right. that's something that we're, we're trying, that the government's trying to deal with. I think when you think about uh, the shutdown of ABS-CBN in this context, there are very, very similar things, similar tactics that were used against Rappler a veneer of legality, that's the first. Uh, the second is using a minor government regulatory agency to deal the death blow. In our case, it was the Securities and Exchange Commission. In ABS-CBN's case, it's the NTC. Uh, and I think that regardless of the method, and here's the last chunk, the government uh, and pro-government information warfare that is happening on social media. This is, you know, the Philippines is, uh, <laughs> it's a country where the Facebook is our internet. A hundred, you're talking about a hundred million people and uh, on Facebook, 70% of the people, actually it's a hundred percent of the people on the, on the internet are on Facebook. So that propaganda warfare has kicked into full, full gear overnight because of this. And you, I will say that, you know, for the first time since we've been in lockdown, you have real people fighting back online. And if you look at Twitter, it's a tug of war. It's, it's really, really fascinating to see what will happen next. I wish I wasn't in the middle of it, but, you know, we are fighting for our democracy. And, the, and that's interesting. So the Twitter, I mean, you know, everything gets, that it, it, Twitter's its own kind of has its own kind of rules and its own kind of um, problem sometimes. But so there has been the populace and Twitter and P Facebook has been standing up for the press. So that's largely what you've been seeing or a lot of what you've been seeing. I think that uh, let me talk about silver linings, right? Uh, social media platforms have helped the creation of cheap armies on social media have eroded democracies all around the world. And the first report that came out about that was 2017. We felt it firsthand. You know, I, the, when that weapon was unleashed, I was getting an average of 90 hate messages per hour in 2016, right? For the pandemic, because lies kill, uh, the social media platforms are actually taking down the lies. Uh, think about social media as behavioral modification systems that actually are designed to spread lies laced with anger and hate 
faster than boring facts. You know, the, the work we do as journalists, uh, you know that book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow? That's a thinking slow process. Daniel Kahneman wrote this, Nobel Prize winner. So journalism and thinking slow is, is completely shoved aside by the design of social media platforms, which is emotionally driven. It's thinking fast. It's to get you angry. Again, lies laced with anger and hate. So the silver lining in the pandemic is that the platforms are far more proactive, are doing things, taking down content uh, that they never did with uh, political disinformation, right? The uh, it took until 2018 before the efforts of Russian disinformation, the IRA and the GRU, before that was taken down. And uh, it, the attacks against journalists continue still on, on uh, Facebook. Um, so I think they've proven they can do it. They've, they've proven that when everyone is at risk, uh, they will take down content for safety reasons. But the question here is, Will they have the courage, as journalists do every day, to stand up to power and take down political disinformation and inciting to hate attacks against journalists and women in particular? So it's, it's, a, it's a silver lining, right? I just hope that they take it further and help er stop the erosion of the public sphere. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Le Helene, I wanted to ask you that um, this toxic lockdown culture, is that something you're feeling there? You had, you had talked about, um, you know, the number of journalists who have been arrested there um, and, and what that means. But is that, do you, would you say that that is happening in Turkey? Um, as well, yes. I mean, anything that uh, the authorities don't like, any kind of message, any kind of comments uh, that the authorities don't really like about uh, the response on, against COVID, um, bad things can happen. For example, uh, recently there was a, an anchor for Fox Turkey, which is a commercial channel. He just uh, posted something on Twitter um, asking a question about the uh, national fundraiser. So the, this national fundraiser is for anyone to donate some to donate some money. He was just wondering: is it is it uh, normal that uh, uh, normal people, people who have sa savings, people who suffer during this crisis because the economy is very bad, is it uh, is it okay that it's them donating the money? And uh, actually, President Erdogan filed a complaint against him. Uh, his show was uh, off the air for three days, and now there is a, a lawsuit against him, and he, he, might, he might go to prison d just for that. Um, the Ministry of Interior released numbers uh, starting uh, uh, second half of March to the end of April, so 40 days. They have investigated, investigated 6,000 social media accounts and arrested 400 people um, for spreading, I quote, false and provocative uh, content. So uh, it's just about, uh, they've been detained for, you know, uh, questioning the response of the government, things like that. So it's 400 people who have been arrested uh, for this. Um, so it's, there is certainly a toxic uh, environment and to, to talk about the region uh, more broadly, in Iraq, for example, they have been very uh, fast in imposing a, a lockdown uh, in Baghdad, uh, where most of the cases are. Uh, in, in Iraq at the moment, there are about 2,400 cases officially. So the, the, the curfew was um, very fast, came very fast and very strong. However, um, I think now it's been lifted a little bit, uh, but uh, Reuters uh, in a story mid-April, citing multiple sources, um, actually questioned the, the numbers put out by the government, by the authorities, and uh, said that uh, there was a story saying that uh, the numbers were actually much, much higher, and they were banned uh, from uh, reporting in Iraq for three months. So we can see that so in, in the region, um, any kind of um, independent reporting, questioning about the real numbers, it's, it's not really accepted. Thank you. And uh, Mohammed, um, I think I know the answer, but I, <laughs> I will ask it anyways. Would you think that that label applies, this toxic lockdown culture, um, to what you're seeing in your own country and community? 
Well, I think Pakistan, uh, historically and now, especially our current prime minister, looks at Turkey as a, as a role model. Uh, but as far as the media freedoms are concerned, I think they've kind of gone a step ahead of Turkey. Because in Turkey, there are lots of, you know, journalists, writers in jail. Uh, but Pakistan has kind of figured out this way. That why do you need to arrest a journalist if you can just get them fired? I mean, what are they going to do next? Uh, they will make noise on Twitter. Maybe they start a YouTube channel. And then you send your intelligence agencies uh, after them and kind of accuse them of, uh, of defaming the country. Uh, in Pakistan, actually, the reverse has happened. Some of those toxic mayors were already there. Uh, but now uh, we know about them. We didn't be suspected that they had something going. For example, Prime Minister of Pakistan has revealed that the Pakistan intelligence agency, ISI, is helping the government trace every single uh, suspected uh, coronavirus uh, infected uh, person, uh, which kind of basically they have admitted that they can keep track of every single person's uh, movement who basically has a mobile phone. Uh, so that those things were already there and now they're open and they're kind of, you know, being uh, accepted. Uh, another thing that's uh, happened is that, uh, that there already was this uh, kind of this toxic political divisions, uh, not just in Pakistan, but within the region. So sometimes if you look at the Indian media, for example, the last, uh, since this pandemic started, and, uh, and what you see there is that according to, I'm talking about mainstream media, I'm not talking about some fringe lunatic website, I'm talking about mainstream TV channels, mainstream newspapers with, you know, sort of millions and millions and millions of viewers. And there it's being presented as, you know, as another attack from either Pakistan or the Indian Muslims are being held responsible for uh, spreading uh, the virus. And in this environment, one of our journalist colleagues mm, who had gone into exile because his life was under uh, threat. He'd gone into exile, you know, sort of eight, nine years ago. Sajid Hussain, his name was. Uh, one of the finest journalists that uh, I've seen uh, from Pakistan. And he'd taken asylum in Sweden, where he disappeared two months ago. Uh, just last week, his body was found uh, in a river. And the river looks like a little canal. It's not the kind of place where you'll have an accident or go to commit suicide. So we don't know. Uh, but because of this, this, this global kind of uh, thing that we are going through, nobody feels responsible. The deaths, I mean, he was our colleague. We had to try really hard to get his death reported in Pakistani press. Uh, his family has been kind of desperately struggling with the Swedish authorities that please tell us, tell us, tell us something. But now that we are in the middle of this pandemic, so that the, this toxic culture of kind of, you know, sort of just not caring about people if they came from a certain region or if they had a certain background, uh, I think that's, uh, that's become even stronger because I guess the assumption is that since so many people are dying or everybody's going to die in the end, so why care about uh, dissident journalists who just dies under suspicious circumstances? So that a bit I find quite scary. The, the very fact of the disruption allowing mm. This, mm. this to occur. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we go to questions, and we have some good questions, uh, Sarah's been fielding me here. Um, I wanted to ask you all, what can we do about this? Um, this has been, you know, a very difficult time, and those who support a free press sort of feel this slipping away. The world press rankings that came out the other day, you know, are, are very scary. Um, what do we do, especially given the upside down nature of the world right now, besides uh, those of us who are journalists doing our jobs and doing them well, um, what else can be done? What can be done to support a free press, especially in places where it's getting tougher and tougher for the press to, to be free? Um, Helene, I'll start with you, put you on the spot. 
Um, okay, the Turkey media landscape, okay, it's, it's very difficult, it's been uh, decimated, it's been a few years now between uh, so many outlets have been shut down or taken over by uh, uh, com companies that are uh, close to the government, so critical reporting is very difficult in Turkey, but uh, speaking from a broader point of view, I think, and the, the Pulitzer uh, prizes were announced maybe two days ago, and I was thinking about that. And I think it's very important to keep supporting, for example, your local paper, keep buying your paper, buy a subscription to the website that you read every day. I think it's very important, especially now, even though you know it's, it's difficult every, every month, you, you uh, keep a few, a little bit of uh, dollars, euro or whatever, to buy a subscription, to keep doing what you're doing, to keep reading to keep a critical eye and uh, for us journalists to keep doing what we do, um, look for the underreported story, not uh, take what the government says for, uh, for to account, uh, keep them to account, et cetera. So I don't know, that's just my, my two cents. No, I think that's really important, particularly local press. We've in the US where I'm from, you just see um, you know, during the virus, more and more people have lost their jobs. Publications have been closed down, not by the government, but because they can't afford to keep running anymore. Yeah. So and the, uh, the, that free press and is the not great, free, as you say. The great, <laughs> the great reporting comes from local media most often. Yeah, yeah I think that's a really good point. Uh, Maria, uh, what, what can we do? What can all of us do? So I, I, I wrote this uh, for time early on when the when the lockdown began, you know, we have to make sure that we don't let the virus infect democracy. And journalism is the first, the first line of defense, uh, shine the light, right? So, and there are three ways that we think about it. Uh, I would think about it this way. This is a time, the first is editorial, you know, for journalists ourselves, we have to be able to evolve the way we do journalism, the kind of journalism we do, because the world has never lived through anything like we're living through now. So, for example, if we don't trust government figures and, you know, we have a government that we have openly challenged its drug war numbers, we are openly challenging these numbers that are coming out uh, and we're keeping track of what's available through big data, right? So we've kept track that, you know, at the beginning when the lockdown began, we were only, we had only tested 12 people for every million Filipinos. You have 100 million Filipinos. Now we're at 1,200 tests for every million Filipinos. So we, we look for leading indicators, other ways using technology and data to be able to, uh, to be able to counter and check. Uh, I think the other thing is our community. We need to use, and, and this is where uh, fighting for our democracy lies with everyone. It isn't just the journalists, right? You give up these rights, you will never get them back. Uh, that's a lesson history has taught us. So that's the first. The second is, how do we take care of our people? There are tons of voluntary things that have come up for the frontliners, the real, the frontliners, the, the, the medical profession, the medical frontliners. Journalists are also frontliners in a different way. And we just had to order uh, PPEs for our journalists, right? Uh, help, help us out in something like this. I, and then the third one is, this is an extinction level event for independent news groups, the smaller ones and maybe even the larger ones. You know, uh, this is something that we've discussed in larger forums. Very early on, I was part of a discussion with donor organizations who were trying to figure out what can they do to help independent news survive. Uh, beyond that, it's gone further uh, The for World Press Freedom Day in the discussion with um, with the UN Secretary General, with the UNESCO Director General. Helping independent news survive is going to be critical to hold, uh, to keep facts, to keep the integrity of facts. Uh, and then that directly connects to the role of technology and social media platforms. Because without the journalists doing the fact checks, without the people who, are, who were the traditional gatekeepers, how then are we going to protect the public sphere? How do we take back these tremendous powers that we are giving to leaders around the world? And probably the most egregious is Hungary, right? Which is indefinitely given to government, at least in the Philippines. We will review it again within three months of March 24th. But there's a lot to be done. And if you care about your rights, if you care about democracy, you can't sit back. Uh, and maybe that's part of it. We need to mobilize our communities to act. 
Good. Well, thank you. And I think that's a really good point on the independent and freelancers that are, you know, this is this is something for which many of them won't be able to come back. Um, and then, um, Mohammed, before we go to questions, you know, what can we do? Well, I think journalists are kind of, uh, by the very definition of their profession, a fractious uh, lot. We kind of always uh, uh, disagree with the person sitting next to us in the newsroom. And I think, uh, and I think that's a good thing. But I think there are certain things when we are kind of under attack from all sides, from the government, from our media owners, uh, from people kind of uh, who just basically hate the word journalism somehow. Uh, somehow this new government and this new kind of systems have somehow uh, turned the word journalism and journalists into kind of terms of abuse that they are by the very nature of their profession, they are uh, corrupt and they are evil. So I think we need to fight uh, uh, fight that label. And I think another thing that we need to do is, yes, please keep buying your local papers and, and subscribe to whatever you've been reading for free. That there were voices uh, in our communities which were marginalized even before the pandemic. And I think now there is, lot, in lots of newsrooms, there's this convenient feeling that, oh, we've got like a bigger story to cover. So those voices or those stories are kind of disappearing. So I think we should be mindful uh, of that uh, as well, that we don't completely uh, 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 kind of make these stories, make these voices which are happening uh, with or without the pandemic, uh, that we don't lose sight of them. I think that's a really good point, not to forget um, the, the, the other stories out there. Um, so now we're going to move to questions. We have time. Um, for some questions here, and there have been some that have submitted that I will ask, and but people feel free, people online now on Zoom, feel free to send some more. Um, so uh, one from Eric Wishart, who's our um, first vice president of the FCC here, and is with AFP. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. <laughs> <There's> Eric. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Eric, you're, since you're on, you want to ask your question? If I can, I please. Your question? Sure, go ahead. And thanks to all the speakers, very interesting. Um, I mean, I'd like to ask Maria, probably following on from your question, Jody, is, I mean, there's a first question is, how can you shut down a network like this? And this, this is some, a network that reaches into every house in, in the Philippines. So how can that happen and what happened? I don't usually ask two questions, but I want to ask two questions. So what happens next with um, ABS, CBN? Also, what's Rappler's status at the moment? And the second question, which I would throw open to everybody, but starting with you, Maria, is what can we do internationally? I mean, the FCC issues statements, um, the CPJ does, Amnesty, at the same time, Donald Trump marked Press Freedom Day by saying lamestream media is totally corrupt, the enemy of the people, which probably doesn't help. So, I mean, does international pressure make any difference? I mean, you were the time person of the year. I mean, I saw you in different places getting awards. Does international pressure make any difference in the Philippines, Turkey, or Pakistan? Thank you. Great, I'll thanks, take... Eric. Yeah, why don't you, can you ask the Philippines question first and then the international question, and then we'll throw the international question also to uh, Elaine and Mohammed. Thank you. Are you talk you're talking to me? Yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so I'll start with the end first and then go forward, right? Which is uh, what can the international community do? Uh, I will tell you, I think uh, Rappler survived four years. It's been four intense years that we've been uh, under attack. We've survived because of the help of news groups around the world who helped us shine the light, especially at a time in the early days uh, journalists here in the Philippines were cautious about touching our stories, right? Um, we learned a lot in that time period. So I think, yes, I, international pressure makes a difference, these groups. The fact that so much oxygen has been taken by the coronavirus globally uh, is, is means that a lot of these issues will go by the wayside. And that's a little bit alarming because 
uh, these are global problems, right? The, the virus is one global problem, but the state of democracy is another global problem. The state of press freedom, the, the way journalism will survive, these are global problems as well. Uh, the second one is uh, our status. What's Rappler's status? Uh, uh, I went to court a lot last year, uh, and there were there was a week where several weeks where I would go to have to go to four different courts. So four different courthouses. You ask me a question about the court system in the Philippines. I now know every single like possibility <laughs> that could go. Oh my God! <laughs> but uh, where is it? So silver lining again, right? Uh, my lawyer for the cyber libel case, this is Ted Te, he's a former Supreme Court spokesman, uh, he said that he's never seen a case go so fast. So in about eight months, I was scheduled for a verdict. This is the case where the, the law we supposedly violated hadn't even been enacted yet by the time we published the story that, that they're saying violated the law that didn't exist. Did you get that? Uh, the legal acrobatics to make it a law to make this case. Anyway, so April 3rd was supposed to be my promulgation date, the date of the verdict. Uh, that was postponed because we were, were in lockdown to April 24th. That was postponed yet again now indefinitely because we're still in lockdown. So I'm hoping, I was hoping that given that the government is going to have to focus on the coronavirus, which obviously that isn't the case with the actions against ABS-CBN, but I was hoping that that would allow our judiciary to act in a more independent manner. Um, the other cases are still there and we're waiting for a verdict. And yes, uh, what will happen? What happens next? What happens next? If, if there isn't enough of a public outcry, if Filipinos don't care enough to protect their rights, this crackdown will continue and we're probably next in line. You know, uh, we're prepared, I guess. You have to be, because that's what we have to do during these times. But I'm hoping that enough outrage, hard to be outraged when you are afraid for your life, which is what the coronavirus has done. So it is a perfect storm of all of the things that could potentially kill press freedom in our country. I really want to thank you for helping us survive and helping us shine the light. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Mohammed or Helene, do you want to answer the question, Eric's question about um, does international pressure make a difference? I, think um, a, I can give it a try. Question. Um, sure. I wish I was as uh, optimistic as Maria. <laughs> um, the mood here in Turkey is that uh, Turkey can overcome this crisis by itself, uh, no need for international uh, uh, aid, uh, the fundraiser will be enough, etc. And so, uh, and the mood, that, that's the mood here. And uh, I'll give you an example that there, there was a package of uh, measures that were passed in Parliament and there was a draft law. It has been shelved now, but there was a draft law that uh, seeked to control social media. So any kind of platform that had more than one million users, they would have to register it in Turkey um, and possibly be uh, you know, liable to uh, local laws and, and, and pro pro prosecution if the, some uh, post uh, were critical of the government, etc. So this this has been shelved, but this is uh, probably coming back in the future. So this is quite worrisome. This is a very worrisome trend. But the thing is, the independent media has been decimated. Uh, a lot of people have been arrested since the coup uh, attempt in 2016. People are scared. Uh, people are scared to speak out. Um, so international pressure in Turkey doesn't really work, uh, but there aren't a lot of people to speak out anymore in Turkey at the moment. Okay, thank you. Mohammed. what do you think from, from your vantage point? Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of uh, tempted to say that international uh, pressure doesn't work anymore. It used to. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should stop uh, stop uh, kind of uh, doing that because in the end that's just about the only thing that can help obviously it is much more important that our own journalistic community our own political parties uh, kind of realize that we're kind of on a very very slippery slope sometimes it does help pakistan government had a uh, uh, had a sort of a, a cyber law a new law which was going to criminalize like you know almost everything 
and then there was a lot of uh, noise by uh, by international community and they have put it on the shelf uh, it might come back uh, but yes there are uh, there are times you can never predict when it will work or when it will not so i guess the safe option is all always to make noise and keep making it yeah i think that's a good point even if it's not mm. always working we mm. can't stop mm. um i'm going to ask a question from edith terry yes. i don't know if edith is on or wants to ask yeah. Um, what is my uh, dad doing? Oh, okay. Um, so, um, Edith, would you like to ask the question? Go ahead. Um, well, you, you've answered, I think, quite a bit of it already. But I'm just w wondering, what are the the uh, the pressure points that the that the that the media in the Philippines has has focused on in terms of management of the pandemic? Um, the, you, you mentioned the farmer who was killed, uh, obviously when you put police in control of, of the, uh, management of the crisis, uh, it can be problematic. We've had reports from the U.S. of, of, uh, police brutality, but the social, you mentioned that the so, social media and Facebook has, and, and Twitter have been very good in terms of uh, cutting down the, uh, the disinformation that they were per permissive about uh, uh, during Duterte's uh, campaign and election. Uh, well, what about the mainstream media? Like, what, what are they? What are they doing? Is there a connect between ABS, CBN specifically being shut down and criticism of uh, Duterte's handling of the pandemic? Okay, thank you, Edith. Maria, can you make that equation pretty clear? Yeah, and what about absolutely. the media in the Philippines? Jang, Jang. Uh, I think this is about controlling the public sphere, controlling public opinion. And, you know, we've done a lot of reports that focused on how information operations tried, are actively manipulating public opinion on Facebook, right? Um, in terms of what's happened, it is embedded in the emergency powers law. It's, called, it's euphemistically called bayanihan, which means a whole of country, an entire country working together. Uh, this law, which was signed by President Duterte on March 24th, actually has this clause and it's been used. It's a clause that covers social media, covers journalists, uh, based oh, on that right. law that will actually uh, jail for a month and fine about $20,000 uh, uh, with, with unclear definitions. It gives a, the government tremendous power. It's Article 6F in that law has been used for investigations by the National Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and then we've had egregious moves like having uh, a Department of Labor employee going to the home of an overseas Filipino worker in Taiwan to try to get her to change her Facebook post, to try to get her to uh, take a pro Duterte position. This blew up in the government's face, right? Because that overseas Filipino worker, her name is Lynn Ordador, she was outspoken and she came out and she truly was, uh, was angry that her rights of free speech were taken away. I think what's important here is, is to see them. this as a power grab. And, you know, yeah. when a coup happens, and this is a Philippine tradition, when a coup happens, the first thing that's taken over is the gov is this television stations. So it's already happened. Uh, this is history repeating itself for the Philippines. I often wonder why we survived this. Uh, and I think part of that is because we didn't negotiate. We just kept doing our jobs and mm -hmm. we had the help of the international community and we had the quiet support of our community here in the Philippines. Filipinos who are deathly afraid that our democracy will be killed, right? So ah, I guess the last point I'll say to what you said is that um, it's about a power grab. It's a very simple thing. And right. if you can control the public sphere, you can, you have power. Okay, um, we might go over just a little bit, but I wanted to get one more question in. This is from Ralph Cunningham. I don't know if Ralph wants to go on the camera and ask it. If not, I can ask it. Um, okay, 
Um, it's how much public, oops, we have some feedback here, okay. Um, the, the, question, the question is how much public support is there in your countries for your leaders' anti-media actions? So how much public support are you finding for these, these actions? Is this something that, you know, the, the press is by themselves alone um, uh, standing up for themselves? Elaine, you want to you wanna take that? Um, yeah, like I said before, um, I'm, uh, of, of course, people are outraged when uh, you have a journalist who is suspended, uh, whose who's, who's show is suspended for three days just for a tweet. Um, it's just that the uh, available channels to express those, uh, this outrage uh, are closing down now for the public. So we don't really hear uh, the opposition anymore. Um, so, for example, on, on, on Twitter, you will see a lot of nation, nationalistic posts, posts supporting what's happening, etc. And you don't really see the rest of the story because the, the outlets have closed. That, that's, right. that's the situation. So, of course, there are two sides, but one side, you don't really hear it anymore. Right. That's the problem that there's this megaphone on one side and, and, exactly. and silence on the other. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Maria, uh, are you finding that the public uh, is, is seeming to be supportive of the government's um, of actions at, of late? I think that when the lockdown was announced uh, and when it happened on the Ides of March, uh, you had a public that wanted to follow, right? We wanted more, because think about it again, there are three crises that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the public health, you're dealing with uh, a crisis of leadership, and then you've got, uh, how is a government that has, that has spent so much effort dividing society now going to actually make it work as one? This was the challenge of the government, and I think everyone was willing to work with the government, everyone. Uh, but to have the military and the police lead the way in fighting a virus rang alarm bells early on. And a lot of our coverage at the beginning focused on tests because it was so clear there weren't enough tests and that the government wasn't prepared to do this. The workflow process that the government did, there was an existing disaster workflow process. It created an entirely new one. I think we were very allergic to political patronage at a time when people can die and uh, uh, when it is a race against time to get to get to this virus, to, to see so many speed bumps put in place by power place, political power place, was uh, this is where people were focused on. Now that this has happened with ABS-CBN, we go right back, right? It was mostly an irritant to see that, that clause, clause 6F in the emergency power laws, to, to have that snuck into the law. But we thought, well, it's going to be three months only, so hopefully it's not so bad. Um, those, the way it's been exercised, uh, we've focused on those stories, but those now seem like minor details. To have this happen to ABS-CBN and to have ABS-CBN go black, I think Filipinos are still processing exactly what this means. And uh, we need to tell the world this is uh, extremely dangerous. It is an entirely new landscape that, that is back to the future, right? The last time this happened in the, in the 70s, it was, it was followed by 21 years of a dictatorship. Let's make sure it doesn't go there. Okay, thank you. And Mohammed, uh, what are you what are you finding from the public? Is, is the public seeming to be on the side of the press, or or do they at this point uh, seem to be supporting the government, or is it hard to tell? I mean, I think it's it's a, it's very very kind of bitterly divided uh, politically. Uh, but I think what's more dangerous is that obviously public is they will kind of you know like some journalists and they will like one point of view and others will like other point of view, that, that doesn't worry me that much. What really worries me is that the journalistic community, the media itself is at war with itself. So one news channel is shut down, the other news channel celebrates. One journalist is arrested, some other journalists kind of, you know, uh, cheer it on. So I think I find that uh, a lot more dangerous. As I said earlier, by the very nature of profession, we should not be on the same page. We cannot be on the same page. We, we need our differences. We need to kind of keep those differences, but to personalize it to a level 
that way you are actually cheering government on to come and impose censorship on you or to kind of save you from your own profession. That's what I find really dangerous. Well, uh, join me, please, in thanking. We can't have applause because we're all not together. But join me, please, in thanking our panelists, uh, Maria, uh, Helene, and Mohammed, for a very uh, a spirited, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, I think it's um, one of the the um, more important things we can do uh, for World Press Freedom Day is to discuss uh, how to try to preserve it in an environment which is very difficult. Uh, so again, thank you all, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, and be uh, on the watch for um, news on, our, on the FCC uh, uh, accounts about when this will be uh, posted on our online and uh, on, on our website and uh, on YouTube. Thanks again, everybody. Thank Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Bye.